So let's look here at the impulse control and eating disorders. Some changes to the DSM that we see in the DSM-5. First of all, for impulse control disorders, intermittent explosive disorder, we have expanded the criteria. Now, do we not only consider physical aggression as part of intermittent explosive disorder, but we also consider verbal aggression as well as other behavior that's problematic, including non-destructive and non-injurious behavior. These now fulfill the criteria for diagnosis. We also have set a minimum age of six years, and the reason that we have done this is because clinicians have had a difficult time distinguishing normal temper tantrums that occur during childhood from intermittent explosive disorder. So if you're going to diagnose intermittent explosive disorder, the child needs to be at least six years of age. Trichotillomania, a parenthetically hair pulling disorder, is now classified under the obsessive compulsive and related disorders. I'm still going to treat that here in this lecture, and the reason is simply because uh, trichotillomania is, uh, has been historically classified as an impulse control disorder, and I didn't cover it under the obsessive compulsive and related disorders. You're still going to get the same idea. The, uh, the criteria for trichotillomania is, is still the same. Uh, however, we now classify it under the obsessive compulsive and related disorders. The reason being there's, uh, there's a high comorbidity between trichotillomania and obsessive compulsive disorder itself. As far as the eating disorders, the core diagnostic criteria remain the same, the difference between anorexia and bulimia. However, we have eliminated some things and added some things. So anorexia nervosa, we have eliminated the requirement that amenorrhea is present. Uh, so the reason for this is somewhat obvious. We've always had exceptions in the past, uh, but for instance, if the patient is a man, he's certainly not going to uh, need to have amenorrhea to be categorized as anorexia nervosa. Also, if the patient is older uh, and they're naturally at menopause, or if the patient is taking oral contraceptive pills, or if they're taking uh, any kind of contraception, that's also going to interfere with menstruation and therefore amenorrhea is not really as reliable as it would be if we were dealing with, let's say, an 18-year-old female who is not on any kind of contraception. So that having been said, even though it's not a requirement for diagnosis now, it's still a good marker. So you have uh, a 23-year-old female who you suspect anorexia. If she's not menstruating, it means that there is some kind of malnutrition going on. So even though it's not technically a criteria now that's necessary for diagnosis, it's still a helpful marker uh, that can push you in that direction. Bulimia nervosa, we've changed uh, the criteria somewhat in that the minimum average frequency for binge eating and inappropriate compensatory behavior has changed now from twice weekly to once weekly. So we're hoping to get uh, more sensitivity with our new criteria. So let's start out with impulse control disorders. Um, to begin with, it can be somewhat difficult to distinguish impulse control disorders from OCD. But the most important thing to remember is that impulses are egocentonic and compulsions are egodystonic. The patient with impulse control disorder, they're going to get some level of pleasure out of doing what they do. Whereas the patient with OCD, they're either neutral or they really don't like uh, having their problem. So the best way to, for me to explain this is to, uh, and I think it really makes it a lot more understandable, is to think about, put yourself in the patient's shoes, because the patient is going to be the one that's going to be describing their symptoms to you. So the OCD patient is going to think something like this. I'm so worried my door isn't locked. Okay, so that's the obsession right there. I just can't sleep. There are some symptoms. I know I've checked it six times. There's the compulsions. But I don't know if it's locked. I hate this. I'm so worried. I wish I didn't have to check it. But maybe if I do, I'll fall asleep. There's the desire to um, relieve the obsession um, by doing the compulsion. So you can see that this patient really doesn't like what's going on here. But they're going to do it anyway because they feel that this is the only way to relieve the anxiety. Now let's contrast that with impulse control disorder. 
Wow, I'm just dying to steal that. This is the impulse. I want to steal it so bad. Okay, I know there's a typo there. I want to steal it so bad, it would be so awesome to feel that rush. If only I could take it and get out. I love how it makes me feel afterwards. It's exhilarating. Okay, so this patient is clearly in a different mindset. This patient has an impulse to do something, but the object of what they're doing the goal here is not to relieve anxiety. They may have anxiety, you know, and they're dying to steal it or they're dying to set a fire. But the main goal is to get that rush that they get. The patient with OCD is not going to get a rush. They go check their door and make sure it's locked. They go wash their hands to, to get the germs off. They're not feeling too happy after they do that. You know, they're either, they might have relief, but it's, either a neutral feeling or a negative feeling. The patient with impulse control disorder gets a rush out of what they're doing. It's, it's exciting to them, okay? That's the difference. Ego dystonic and OCD, ego syntonic in patients with impulse control disorder. So there's a lot of impulse control disorders. I put here the five most common. And really, uh, the only difference is uh, what the impulse is. The treatment is generally the same, although there are different routes to go, but um, diagnosing it is going to be pretty easy because all you really need to know is what the impulse is. Um, so let's start out with kleptomania. So as you know, kleptomania is about stealing. These patients, they steal unnecessary objects. Why? Because they're easy to steal. It's easy to steal a couple, you know, uh, candies out of the bulk container at the grocery store or maybe you slip a package of gum into your, into your purse. So they steal unnecessary objects. It's not like they're going and stealing money when they don't have enough money to feed their kids. That's not kleptomania. So the object is not the goal. What the goal is here is to steal and to get the rush from stealing. They feel a pleasure out of stealing. So there are some psychiatric disorders that look similar to this. Antisocial personality disorder, these people might steal, but they don't steal to get the rush. They steal it because they want something and they don't really give a crap if, if it belongs to somebody else. They steal it to hurt other people. They might steal something that belongs to somebody else in order to get back at them. That's antisocial personality disorder, and they might have other symptoms too. A manic episode they could also steal, but they're going to have other symptoms of mania. And this is not going to be something that is an ongoing pattern. It's going to be something that happens over, you know, a short period of time, like a week or maybe even a few days. It's not going to be something that happens over the course of months. So the management for kleptomania is with SSRIs or mood stabilizers. Of course, psychotherapy is always good, too. Trichotillomania is hair pulling. Um, and often it includes eating of one's own hair. So this is hair pulling of your own hair. It's not going and pulling your sister's hair. A lot of times physical signs are going to be present. You're going to see hair loss in these patients. A lot of times it's going to be from their head, from their eyebrows, um, and, and areas around the face. You might notice this on a routine visit. Uh, generally you're going to notice the bald spots, and uh, it may present with complications of hair eating, and that would be, of course, in the emergency room uh, in the case of an intestinal obstruction uh, with a trichobezoar, which is a, uh, a basically a bezoar made out of hair. Um, so uh, remember that generally these patients aren't going to present themselves. Uh, these are usually things that you'll notice or they'll have trouble with the law in other cases. Um, because most of these are egosyntonic. They, the patient really doesn't have a problem with it. So the differential with trichotillomania, if you see the bald spots, obviously alopecia is gonna be uh, the number one thing you're gonna always think of when, when you see baldness. Uh, in alopecia, there's gonna be a, a level of uniformity. Male pattern baldness, it's gonna be symmetrical. And you're not going to see patchiness in alopecia. There is a rare cause of alopecia called alopecia areata, uh, but that's pretty rare. Uh, and usually the USMLE will make it pretty distinct that this is a patient with trichotillomania. 
Tinea capitis, they'll usually be white plaques. Um, and so uh, you can get a biopsy of this, uh, a KOH stain, to find the fungus uh, that causes tinea capitis. Uh, so if you, see the, if you see the white plaques and you're not necessarily suspecting trichotillomania, uh, you should get a, a biopsy to uh, outrule tinea capitis. In an emergency situation, these patients can present with intestinal obstruction. Um, Usually, an intestinal obstruction is not going to be from trichotillomania. It's going to be from sigmoid volvulus. It's going to be from intussusception in a pediatric patient. It's going to be from diverticulosis. So if you see a patient with an intestinal obstruction, you've got to treat the intestinal obstruction. You're not going to treat trichotillomania. But it can be on your radar that when a patient has an intestinal obstruction, that trichotillomania could be a cause. Management for trichotillomania will include SSRIs and psychotherapy. Okay, so pyromania is a big deal because these patients set fires, and that's definitely a problem for other people, not just the patient with pyromania. These patients are going to have a history of legal issues because of their uh, their desire to set fires. The differential, of course, always is going to include, anytime somebody does something illegal, it's always going to include antisocial personality disorder, which is really just a personality disorder of doing illegal things. Um, but in antisocial personality disorder, it's not just going to be setting fires. These people are going to steal things. They're going to be violent. It's not just going to be limited to only setting fires. But look for on the USMLE for antisocial personality disorder or pyromania to be a on the differential um, of the uh, when it's the other one that's the answer. So if the answer is pyromania, look for antisocial personality disorder to be on one of the wrong answers because the two are very linked and similar. Uh, but remember, antisocial personality disorder is not simply limited to fires. Schizophrenia, of course, these patients could set fires um, because they're having psychotic uh, thoughts. So uh, remember to make sure to do a full psychiatric um, history on these patients because there may be psychotic reasons why these patients are setting fires. Unfortunately, there's no good treatment for pyromania. Generally, these patients are going to wind up being wards of the legal system. Intermittent explosive disorder is uh, somewhat common. It's more common in men than in women. These patients, uh, okay, so the impulse is aggression. These patients are going to have a history of legal issues as well because aggression, just like starting fires, um, are generally going to lead to illegal activities. Um, this is sort of your road rage. A lot of patients with severe road rage have intermittent explosive disorder. So the impulse being aggression, their way of acting on it is going to be to take out their aggression on another person um, or sometimes on a, an animal or on objects, but it really becomes an issue when it's another person. The differential here is pretty broad. The differential is really what causes aggression. So I broke it down into three different uh, prominent medical causes and three prominent psychiatric causes. So the medical causes are going to be your neurological causes and your endocrine causes. So let's talk about the neurological causes. Uh, there are two different kinds of uh, degenerative diseases, which we'll talk about in a different section. Um, and one is Pick's disease, and this happens uh, in elderly people. And it's, Pick's disease is really just a frontotemporal dementia. It's like Alzheimer's, but it's not the entire cortex. It's just the frontal cortex and the temporal cortex. Remember that the frontal lobe is your manners and your executive functioning and it's your personality. So in Pick's disease, of course, it's going to be in an elderly person usually, but you're also going to be seeing changes in somebody's personality. This isn't something that's been with the patient for a long time. This is something that's developed over the last few years. Huntington's disease, uh, remember, is a genetic disease. It is autosomal dominant, so this will be in the patient's family. 
Uh, of course, there are uh, signs of Huntington's disease that you can see on neuroimaging, which includes an increased uh, size of the ventricles. Um, there will be other signs of Huntington's disease, such as chorea, and of course, personality change. But most importantly, this is a genetic illness, so there'll be a history of Huntington's disease in the patient's family. Brain tumors, um, of course, this is also going to be uh, a more acute cause, so this isn't going to be something that's been with the patient for a long time, so it's going to be a more acute personality change leading to the aggression. And I put here, of course, especially frontal. Frontal lesions change your personality, it changes your manners, it changes how you act. So these patients will also generally have symptoms consistent with a mass occupying lesion, uh, and you can simply exclude this with a CT. Sertoli Leydig cell tumor, remember, is the testosterone uh, secreting tumor um, that uh, occurs in the uh, testes or ovaries. These patients will have some other symptoms of elevated testosterone. Uh, in the male, this will generally be hirsutism. Uh, in the female, uh, and of course in the male, also male pattern baldness. In the female, you'll see baldness and voice deepening and hirsutism as well. Um, so look for those symptoms in, in a, the Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. Psychiatric causes can include antisocial personality disorder. You can probably see a pattern here. Uh, intermittent explosive disorder will be simply aggression, um, and it'll be uh, antisocial personality disorder will be less intermittent. So, with antisocial personality disorder, it's going to be more of a continuous history where intermittent explosive disorder is going to be, like the name says, intermittent. And antisocial personality disorder patients won't report feelings of tension and anxiety before the episode and relieved after the, uh, the act. Antisocial personality disorder patients are just going to be mean in general and it's not really going to change anything. Borderline personality patients have labile mood and suicidal ideation and attempts. Um, generally these patients don't have problems with aggression but it can happen. And of course schizophrenia, they're going to report psychotic symptoms surrounding the event. Management for intermittent explosive disorder is going to be with SSRIs and mood stabilizers. You can also use antipsychotics on these patients, but SSRIs tend to be the preferred therapy and antipsychotics are going to be sort of your uh, second line. So psychotherapy can be useful for these patients as well to teach these patients how to deal with really what is their anger. Because remember, the impulse to be aggressive is really anger. Pathologic gambling. All right, so uh, pathologic gambling, um, there's a typo on here. I was I usually use the slides from uh, from another, from the other uh, lectures. Um, two or more, ignore two or more symptoms for six months or more. Okay, so impulse, impulsive gambling. Um, these patients, you're going to see a history of prominent social deterioration. So, what is social deterioration? This is really what happens when you are not able to keep or hold money. Um, so you're going to lose your job. Why do you lose your job? Because you're spending your money and you're spending your time away from, uh, from work because you're gambling. You lose your spouse. Why do you lose your spouse? Because you're spending all the money. Your credit's going to go in the crapper. You're going to have financial problems because you're spending all your money. These patients, they'll go from having a nice house and a, and a nice family down to possibly abusing drugs and living on the streets. That's social deterioration, and that's something that's a little more prominent in pathologic gambling. Definitely watch for su uh, concomitant substance abuse in these patients. Uh, that's a little more prominent in the pathologic gambling than in the other impulse control disorders. These patients can resort to illegal acts to obtain money for gambling. Pathologic gambling is really like a substance abuse, except their substance is gambling, and the high they get is from the risk that they're taking with gambling. So like a lot of substance abuse disorders where the substances are expensive and they lose their jobs and have social deterioration and no longer have enough money to afford the substances, patients with pathologic gambling may resort to illegal acts to obtain money for their uh, gambling desires.
Differential is going to include a manic episode. These patients with manic episode are usually going to have other symptoms of mania. Actually, they will always have other symptoms of mania. And it's going to be more short-lived, and because it's more short-lived, there's going to be less social deterioration. And this is a big one here, and this is something that the USMLE likes to throw at you uh, occasionally. And that is that pathologic gambling can be an adverse effect of pramipexol. Why? Because pramipexol is an, uh, a dopamine agonist. Pramipexol is something that we use to treat uh, Alzheimer's, or sorry, Parkinson's and uh, restless leg syndrome. So you may get a question stem that uh, says that you have a patient being treated for Alzheimer's that, uh, or sorry, a patient treating, uh, being treated for Parkinson's or restless leg syndrome uh, that suddenly has developed this pathologic gambling and it may say which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's problems, Pramipexol is the drug to look at. Uh, so keep that in mind, it's just a little, uh, a little piece of trivia that uh, might score you an extra point on your exam. Management for pathologic gambling, the best thing we can do for these patients is refer them to Gamblers Anonymous. It's social support, it's really the Alcoholics Anonymous for gambling. We can also add individual therapy, that always helps, but Gamblers Anonymous is the best way to go. Okay, so let's move on to eating disorders. So really this has nothing to do with impulse control disorders. I just added the two of these because they're really, they both kind of reflect a level of anxiety, but they're separate. Okay, so eating disorders are not impulse control disorders, but they, they both have in common that they reflect some level of anxiety. Okay, so really the most important thing is that you know how to differentiate anorexia from bulimia. So first let's talk about what they have in common, because they're often associated with each other, and for good reason, because they have some similarities. So in both anorexia and bulimia, patients can be in the binge purge pattern, which means they eat a lot and then they throw it up, or they might fast, which means that they don't eat much at all, or they exercise a lot. Physical signs when you see a patient with anorexia or bulimia can include poor dentition. Obviously, if you're purging and you're throwing up, the vomiting is going to cause uh, wearing of the enamel on the teeth. Uh, it can include or present with Mallory Weiss tears, um, which is a longitudinal tear of the lower esophagus, and that will present with painless hematemesis. So if a patient, especially a teenage girl, presents with painless hematemesis, you got to keep in, why, uh, in, in mind Mallory Weiss tears, uh, which is a, uh, generally almost, is almost always caused from frequent vomiting. Um, you'll al also see Mallory Weiss tears with other things, but in young people, definitely think eating disorders because most young people don't have a reason to be chronically vomiting. The labs uh, that you get on these patients uh, will, uh, will reflect frequent vomiting if they are indeed the binge purge type. Uh, and what is that? Well, if you get a metabolic profile, it's going to be hypochloremic, hypokalemic metabolic acidosis. Why is that? Well, you got the uh, chlorine in uh, the hydrochloric acid that's in the stomach, if you're throwing all that up, well, then you're going to have low chlorine. And since it's acid, um, if you're throwing up acid, you're going to pull acid out of the blood, and so your blood is going to be uh, alkaline. Uh, both patients are going to be preoccupied with how they look. And, uh, of course, as we know um, just from reading the news, uh, both anorexia and bulimia are most common in adolescent females. So now what make these different? First off, the most prominent thing is anorexic patients are going to be very underweight. Bulimic patients aren't underweight. They might be a few pounds underweight, but they're not severely underweight. Anorexic patients are underweight. Anorexic patients also have to have missed three menstrual cycles. That is a diagnostic criteria. So three months of no period, three months of amenorrhea. Of course, you can have men who are anorexic. It's not common. So if it's a man, obviously the diagnostic criteria won't include three months of amenorrhea. 
Uh, anorexic patients will often show outward signs of malnutrition. Um, remember that bulimic patients are usually or are almost always uh, in that very close range of being within uh, being within their normal weight. So they might be a little underweight, they might be at their normal weight, or they might be a little overweight, or they might be very overweight. Um, so bulimic patients aren't going to be very malnourished. They're not going to look malnourished. Anorexic patients, they're very underweight. Their body is in a uh, problem stage. So they are going to show signs of malnutrition. What are these? Hair loss. Lanugo hair. That's that peach fuzz hair that you see on babies. They're going to be emaciated. There's going to be muscle loss, especially around the ribs. That's not a good place to see muscle loss if you, if, if you have to lose muscle, because what's around there? The lungs and the heart. So they're going to be emaciated. You, you might always, also see peripheral edema. What's peripheral edema from? That's because they're not getting enough protein. So because they've got low protein in their blood, they're practically in a kwashiorkor state. So they're going to have edema just from the, uh, the low oncotic pressure. And you'll see this in the extremities. You'll also see physical signs such as bradycardia and hypotension. Bradycardia because the, the system, the whole body system, is in a state of starving. And hypotension because the patient is often uh, dehydrated because of the binging and purging. So let's focus on anorexia. So as we mentioned, anorexia is much more severe, presents much more severe uh, than bulimia. The patient's under, underweight and more malnourished. Anorexia is more of a body image disturbance and not so much, uh, not so much as bulimia, which is, is more of a, uh, a fixation on, uh, on weight. So because it's a body image disturbance, these patients are never going to be thin enough. They'll lose weight, and you'll say, wow, you're thin, and they'll say, no, I'm fat. And they'll lose more weight, and they'll lose more weight, but they'll always feel that they're overweight. These patients will never be happy with their weight, even though they'll be emaciated thin. They don't see themselves that way. It's prominently a body image disturbance. It's similar to body dysmorphic disorder, but remember, body dysmorphic disorder is focused on a specific part, like my nose, my lips, my ears, my feet aren't big enough, or in some men, their you-know-what's not big enough. Whereas anorexia is more of an overall body image disturbance. I'm always, always, always fat. I'll never be thin enough. And they just get so thin until they die, unless they're treated. The differential for anorexia includes any condition that may cause weight loss. So focus here particularly on the cancers. Uh, especially ALL and AML, because these can come on pretty insidiously. Hyperthyroidism is another thing to think about. Um, in hyperthyroidism, you're going to see other signs, um, particularly tachycardia. You'll, are, you'll also want to exclude uh, bulimia, but usually that's pretty, um, pretty apparent based on the appearance of the patient. The diagnosis here is clinical, uh, but the labs are going to help. So the management here is going to be immediate psychiatric hospitalization. You're not going to let these patients out of the hospital. They're going to tell you that they're fine. They're going to say over and over, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. They're going to deny it. But these patients can't be allowed to leave the hospital because these patients are very clearly a threat to themselves because they can't care for themselves. These patients are psychiatrically ill, just like a patient who is delusional, just like a patient who is suicidal. These patients have to be hospitalized. And so this is a case where you might need to get a, uh, a, an involuntary hospitalization. You're going to want to, if you're the psychiatrist, you're going to want to consult an internist or pediatrician uh, to manage their malnutrition. Um, and then after you get these patients stabilized, a live-in group therapy is the most effective way because if they're binge purge, they're going to go back to their ways. If, they're, if they don't eat, they're not going to be uh, encouraged to eat if they're on their own. So live-in group therapy is the best way for these patients to, to come out of anorexia. Uh, meanwhile, they're giving, getting group therapy at home. They're going to be, uh, or group therapy in the live-in setting. They're going to be getting psychotherapy as well. Uh, the importance here has got to be on the weight gain, not just the eating. Remember that there are patients who eat 
and they have anorexia, but they, they eat and then they go exercise a ton, or they eat and then they throw it up. So it's not just, oh, look at this patient, they're eating, okay, that's good. It's this patient needs to gain weight. That is the only way we can effectively prove that this patient is in less harm. In anorexia, always look for comorbid psychiatric disorders, which may be contributing to the patient's problem. And that includes depression, borderline personality, and obsessive compulsive disorder, and you're going to treat these accordingly. Bulimia. These patients, as we mentioned, their outward symptoms are going to be less severe, but these patients still require uh, psychiatric involvement. You're not going to uh, admit these patients, but they are going to need some outpatient therapy. Uh, in bulimia, the obsession is more about the appearance. So these patients aren't going to have so much of a dysmorphic view of their body. Some of these patients, they might lose the weight and then they get down to where they are happy with their weight and then they stop and then they gain the weight and then they come back. And really it's just the bulimia is really more of how they're handling their, uh, their, their views of their weight. These patients will be around their normal weight. Uh, they might be a little above, they might be a little bit below, but they're not going to be less than 17.5 uh, BMI like the anorexic patients. Binging and purging is much more common in bulimia than anorexia, but that's really uh, nothing that's going to help you differentiate between the two. And frequently in bulimia, you're going to see borderline personality disorder, so keep that in mind. The management for bulimia is going to be intense outpatient psychotherapy and SSRIs. So not quite as intense as anorexia, just because these patients are not quite as uh, malnourished. But there might be vitamin problems just because of, uh, of the mm -hmm. vomiting and there may be uh, what's even more problematic is in patients that constantly vomit, hypokalemia can cause uh, heart uh, arrhythmia disturbances. So you have to keep that in mind as well. EKGs are always good to have on anorexic and bulimic patients. The usual cause of death in these patients is going to be arrhythmia from hypokalemia. And what are you going to see in arrhythmia from hypokalemia? You're going to see uh, small T waves. Okay, so this is um, what you see in a patient that frequently vomits. I'm not saying that this patient did that, but this is worn down tooth enamel. So this is acid erosion, which wears down the enamel, and you see these brown spots. So these brown spots are where the tooth has been worn down, no enamel there, and this uh, can only be treated uh, with dental uh, replacement. This isn't something that we take care of, uh, this is something for the dentist to do, but this is a useful sign that a patient has been having a lot of vomiting because this is acid erosion. This is lanugo hair. This is uh, really cute on the baby and it's great. It's peach fuzz, it's adorable, but if you see this on an adult patient, you should be concerned, uh, especially if they appear malnourished. This is a sign of malnourishment in an adult. This is a Mallory Weiss tear, uh, as seen on a upper endoscopy. Uh, you can see here that there's uh, the one on the right is much deeper and more uh, more prominent than the one on the left. But these are longitudinal tears uh, right at uh, or above the uh, level of the gastroesophageal junction, and these uh, these tears um, can bleed and they can bleed into the stomach and when the patient vomits, uh, it'll be bloody. But it won't be painful because uh, it hasn't penetrated to the level of the nerve. So it's a longitudinal tear which causes painless hematemesis. Uh, and it's visualized in, un in endoscopy. That's really the only way to see it. These will be painless, so the only way to see it is going to be on endoscopy. And suspect this in a patient with painless hematemesis. So finally, uh, this is something that I came across a, 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 about a week ago. Um, there is a rise in anorexia in young children, even as young as kindergarten. So 
something to think of. What's causing this? You know, is this a medical disorder or is this something that we as society have pushed that women have to be so thin that children as young as six years old are learning to do this? Definitely something to keep in mind when we think of where our culture is going. So I will see you in the next section.